Is that a broken CV axle? I guess the internet was right. So obviously last fall I got the car working and it performed fantastic. Uh, I couldn't be more delighted with that and so now I'm moving on to uh, upping the horsepower. We'll get to that later in the video and uh, refining a few things and one of the obvious things was which I've mentioned several times in the course of a couple of videos is the CV joints and this tr cross shaft or the jack shaft that goes through the oil pan were never meant to be permanent. Um, there's been some comments on the videos uh, about how these are not going to work and why would I go through all that effort and do this. They obviously didn't watch the whole video where I say many times that these were just proof of concept. Uh, last fall I knew there was no way I could get all this done in time and drive it in the fall so I had to make some decisions and I decided to make these temporary axles uh, which was the right decision but and I'm actually pretty proud of this uh, this how this turned out with welding these two axles together if that would have broke inside the oil pan uh, that would have been a disaster so I have to say I, I didn't admit in the last couple of videos but one of these welded axles did break uh, you can see where I kind of kludged it back together I actually welded it back together right on the car um, I was trying to get some footage of a four-wheel burnout, if you will, in the driveway uh, by wetting the driveway down because it hadn't rained in months. And uh, to say I was abusing the car is an understatement, which is going to be my mantra in general. The whole point of this thing is to be beat on, right? It's not meant to be a all-wheel drive garage queen. It's meant to be an all-wheel drive car that I go to the track, beat on it, drive it to work, and, and everything else. So I actually was doing clutch dumps in my driveway with this thing and this axle actually broke. But luckily since it was just, a, it, it sleeved, right, it was a, it's, a, it's a tube over two sides, I didn't even notice it at first. It was completely uneventful. Matter of fact, I drove it up and down the street and I probably could have drove it a long ways like that. It wasn't until I went to go do the next clutch dump that I, the back tires basically started spinning. I realized I didn't have it all-wheel drive um, because, of course, there was an open axle in the front. So, but the original intention was always to replace these. And so the first goal is to make the, um, the jack shaft or the cross shaft that goes through the oil pan. And that's what I'm gonna go into first. The, uh, the, the cross shaft and the jack shaft um, that, I'm, that I'm working on all started out as basically hot rolled uh, raw 4340 bars. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to become self-sufficient. I want to be able to make CV axles myself, right? Obviously, I could hire this out, but just I want to be able to do it myself. And so, part of that is figuring out the material, where to get it, where to get it heat treated. So, I ordered this from a, a big national metal supply house. Um, this happens to be inch and a half, but I got inch and a half, inch and three eighths, inch and a quarter, depending on the part I'm making. Uh, hot rolled, that's why it's got the scale. Hot rolled 4340. I then had it heat treated at a local uh, heat treat shop, a place we actually use at work. So this part actually has been heat treated, that's why it's got these marks on it, because they tested the hardness after heat treat. And I specified, you know, this is 4340, and I specified 43 to 45 RC for hardness. Uh, that should be a good uh, compromise between ductility and strength and also it's still pretty reasonable in machine. Matter of fact, it machines beautifully uh, as you'll see in a second. And I'm doing everything in the hardened state. I'm machining it, I'm splining it, everything in the hardened state. Not only does it actually, I think, machine better in the hardened state, but then there's no risk of heat treating it after the fact and having it warp, especially on the long uh, shaft that goes through the oil pan. So anyway, so once you get into material, uh, the first step is prepping it and we'll get into that right now. Since the axles in the cross shaft are so long, they have to be supported on the other side by using a live center in the tailstock. So the first step to prep the material was simply facing off the ends and using a center drill to put the angle on the end to be able to interface with the live center. 
I've actually gotten quite a few requests to go over in more detail some of the equipment I'm using. And uh, you might have noticed since the last time I did any turning operations on the channel that I have a new lathe. After looking for literally a decade, I finally found uh, my dream machine locally at an auction. And so I wanted to show off my new toy. And this is a Prototrack 1745, a hybrid manual CNC lathe. And so you may ask yourself, well, what's so special about this? Well, basically you can use it in manual mode, as you can see here. One of the cool features of this lathe and kind of the whole point is the fact that you can program it to do CNC functions, but it also is completely, can be used as a manual lathe. So it's got these hand wheels that are actually just encoders that basically move the cross slide in the carriage, um, as you can see. It just like a manual mill, plus you also have kind of this high-speed jog joystick for getting around quickly. And you can use it completely in a CNC mode. It actually has a pretty good built-in conversational programming system for making simple things like chamfers and radiuses, things that are actually kind of tough to do on a regular manual lathe. Plus you can actually interface it with G-Code to like Fusion 360. Uh, my friend Harold and I have gotten that working and I've even replaced kind of the ancient floppy drives with a USB interface to be able to get the data from Fusion 360 quite easily. And it's been just working great for me. As you can see in the following footage, it makes excellent parts. The next step in making the parts was getting them set up between the chuck and the live center and then uh, roughing out the OD and getting rid of all the mill scale because of the fact that it was uh, hot rolled steel. The next step was uh, choking up on the part a bit to get rid of the overhang and using a four jaw chuck to dial in the run out. And here you can see where I programmed in the complete end geometry of the part uh, using the Prototrack conversational programming and made it quite easy to get the right geometry and complete with uh, chamfers. The groove was then put in for the snap ring that holds the CV joint on and this side of the part was complete. Next up, the part was flipped around and the runout was dialed in once again using the four jaw chuck. And then the main diameter that goes through the oil pan was dialed in. The other side of the shaft that actually goes into the differential was then programmed into the uh, prototrack using the conversational programming. And once again, all the chamfers and different steps were put in one operation. This step is the precision diameter that the bearing gets pressed down to and also where the seal rides for the differential. The shaft in this right here is actually too long. The splines go on that step while this section gets cut off. Next up was the groove for the snap ring that actually holds the uh, shaft into the differential spider gear. And here's the completed jack shaft ready to get some splines. My other upgrade since the last time I've shown uh, cutting some splines in a video is this new, um, much more appropriately sized for my mill CNC indexer. If you go way back when I resplined the main shaft of the transmission, I actually used a, a manual indexer, which completely works. Um, the problem is, is if you're kind of sneaking up on it, you have 31 teeth and you're taking a, you know, sneaking up on your dimensions. Uh, it can get a little nerve-wracking, uh, especially when you have a very valuable part, your hand cranking it, and you can, are you going to lose track? Because it isn't just a simple number of turns. You have to kind of go past your starting point, X number of slots, and it really is nerve-wracking. And so I wanted to get a CNC version, and so if you watch the video where I re the CV joint, um, I had a, a CNC indexer in that, but it was much bigger with an 8 inch chuck. And it was really too big and too heavy for this mill, plus it was too heavy for me to get on and off the mill on my own. It was just, you almost needed a crane. And it weighed 200 pounds. And so I sold that off, and I got this once again at a local auction for a really good price. And it only weighs about, well, it weighs 60 pounds minus the chuck, so now it probably weighs 80 pounds. But 
either way I can lift it up off the uh, off the mill by myself is the key and then it came with a much newer easier to program and more modern controller than the other CNC one I had this is way more logical we'll say it's mid 2000s uh, technology versus early 90s technology and you can imagine it was massively different and so here you can set up your number of teeth or number of indexes and et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, either index it manually um, or I actually have it wired into the uh, mill now and I'll show you that in a second. With the new uh, CNC indexer, I have it actually wired into this, the Centroid control and I created a, an M code to operate it. So I can go like an MDI here and I created M13 and now when I hit cycle start that causes it to index and I can incorporate the M13 into my either my G code or I'm really using the built-in conversational programming of, of this machine too uh, to create a program to index around and cut the cut the splines in the last couple of videos where I've shown uh, splining shafts, people have asked me what kind of tooling I use to make the splines. And I use uh, tooling from a company called Advent Tools. Uh, this is this holder here is a part number 125-TA-01. Uh, the 01 means it's a single flute cutter. It only has a single tool holder in it. Um, the, the dash 3 is actually more common and can sometimes be found on eBay. Uh, I bought this new and it's a couple hundred dollars for this holder and then the then you get these carbide inserts uh, that go into the holder you can see they screw into it here and these carbide inserts are set up for whatever uh, spline you're gonna do this is actually a one module spline for the total differential splines I'm putting into the uh, the cross shaft uh, a one module in this case and you buy these individual inserts for whatever spline you're going to do 32 pitch, 24 pitch, in this case one module and the beauty of these is these are set up to make a true involute spline um, just like the OEMs do, you know, like, like the factory parts are an, are an involute spline you often see hobbyists will make splines just using like a, 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 um, a chamfer tool in this case if you're doing a 45 degree pressure angle spline you'd use one of these which is a uh, a 90 degree um, chamfer tool and I'm convinced in most cases this works perfectly fine and would be completely acceptable but the engineer in me and the fact that I've designed involute gears in my day job I just couldn't handle not making true involute splines and so I bought these holders and which makes the splines as close to OEM as, as you can make them and as, as a hobbyist in your garage uh, these are actually meant for, you know, production like by an actual machine shop to make uh, involute splines. Anyways, I hope that makes sense. And if you want to replicate what I'm doing, uh, all these things are available right from Advent's website. Or you said you can watch eBay for at least the holders and try to get a better deal on them. So now that we have that uh, behind us, let's uh, go cut some splines. Here's some of the practice spline uh, parts I did before committing to the real uh, actual shaft. Uh, after you know doing the splines on the transmission and on the CV joints, I've realized how critical it is or how touchy it is to the actual spline depth uh, to getting the fit on the mating part. Uh, literally a half a thou difference in depth on the radius can go from having a very sloppy fit to a spline to a very nice uh, nice snug fit. And so it's really critical that you have like a practice part to be able to kind of sneak up on the the depth of the spline so as you can see I did three different practice cuts to dial in the right dimension for the 27 spline on the, on the Toyota diff and then I actually you know, there's another part here someplace I did three also for the 29 spline that goes into the driver side CV joint so this is a 24 pitch um, in, you know inch style spline and of course the tortoise spline is a 27 tooth uh, one module metric spline for the tortoise differential but anyways once I had all my dimensions dialed in I started actually cutting the splines on the real part 
The first step in splining the shaft is getting it set up in the new uh, CNC indexer and then making sure it's aligned or it's square to the mill so that these splines are square to the part. The probe was then used to find the center line of the part. And finally we're making some chips. I set up the program to actually make the splines in two passes, uh, basically about 20 thousandths of depth uh, per pass. And I purposely left this footage here in real time to show the speed of the uh, cutting operation. This was based on the feeds and speeds suggested by the uh, manufacturer of the inserts with the fact that we don't have cooling and the amount of material uh, that we're removing. Here's the test fit into the Toyota differential, and I have to say the fit was awesome. Then it was a bit of a rinse and repeat to flip the part around and do the 29 spline uh, 24 pitch that goes into this uh, driver's side uh, CV joint. So here's the original welded axle that I used in the, in the fall, and here's the new masterpiece here, my one-piece 4340 uh, heat-treated uh, cross shaft. I have to say I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, it turned out pretty great. They may be wondering why this section is discolored. Actually, about halfway through the machining process, when I was roughing it out, I realized that the shaft wasn't heat-treated to the right temper, and so I actually sent it back, and they agreed and reheat-treated it, and this section was already roughed out Hence, it has the uh, discoloration from heat treat. But uh, it turned out great. Next thing is to put the bearing on, just like the welded shaft, and uh, make sure it fits into the CV joint. Success! On to the next project. So all this work is in preparation for adding more power to the car. I'm proud to share that I've partnered with VMP Performance to bring the world's first all-wheel drive S550 Mustang up to the next level. More action will be coming this summer, so if you want to see that, please uh, subscribe and hit that notification button. And until then, thanks for watching.